Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Jane Ransom, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Brain Foundation. I really want to thank you for coming. Tonight, we're going to learn about receiving a brain disease diagnosis. You know, and that's something we know that one in six at least people have a brain disease in the United States. Uh, and so we know that there are literally millions of people facing uh, a diagnosis at one time or another, or their loved ones are. And uh, we have two just really inspiring uh, speakers here tonight uh, to talk with us firsthand about what that's like and what it, what it has meant for their lives. So um, I, just to say a couple words about the American Brain Foundation, we're just committed to sharing valuable resources and increasing public awareness of brain disease. And our, our webinar events like this one tonight are opportunities for you to connect with experts in various topics of interest around brain disease. The American Brain Foundation funds research across the entire spectrum of brain diseases because we know that the brain diseases are interconnected. We are scientifically certain of that. And um, we know that curing one brain disease will mean curing more brain diseases. Um, we also know, as I said before, that tens of millions of Americans suffer from brain, brain diseases and disorders. And that's why the American Brain Foundation has invested more than $40 million in research grants to almost 300 researchers. So let's move on to our topic uh, for the night, receiving a brain disease diagnosis with our panelists. They are Ben Lanai, who is a biotech investor, a rare disease activist, and vice chair of the board of the American Brain Foundation, and is based in Silicon Valley, California. And then we have Justine Fedak, who's a marketing executive and a motivational speaker based in Chicago. Now, I had the privilege of seeing um, Justine and Ben in action about a month ago at the same event. And um, I can promise you we're going to learn and be inspired by them tonight. So thank you, Justine and Ben, for joining us. And uh, we're going to do have some panel discussion, and then we will open it up for Q&A um, for at least 15 or 20 minutes uh, at the end of the hour tonight. So I would just like to ask you to briefly uh, introduce yourselves uh, professionally and personally, if you're comfortable. and provide some background on your story and your diagnosis. You wanna take it away, Ben? Sure, sure. Wonderful to be uh, here tonight. Um, so I'm Ben, uh, based in uh, Palo Alto, California, and uh, I'm uh, 56 years old. And uh, my story uh, really started around age 40 when I started uh, manifesting a, a number of neurological symptoms. And after a uh, two-year uh, diagnostic odyssey at uh, Stanford and UCSF, uh, finally got diagnosed with a uh, rare uh, neurological disease uh, caused by a single gene mutation, X-linked adrenocodystrophy, or X-linked ALD, uh, which some of you may remember from the movie Lorenzo's Oil. And uh, it is a, um, a disease with many different phenotypes. Uh, it's pretty, pretty well known for the pediatric phenotype, which is uh, horrible, is really a, a brain uh, inflammation disease and uh, quickly lethal. And then you have a adult phenotype, which is uh, late onset and, uh, and uh, progressing more slowly. Uh, but in any case, uh, that was 10 years ago. Uh, I uh, started a, a foundation with my neurologist uh, to uh, advocate and uh, research for this disease and, um, and eventually made my way to become a biotech investor uh, to invest in uh, uh, either assistive devices or drug discovery companies that can help people with brain disease. 
and uh, joining the board of the American Brain Foundation. Fantastic. Justine, give us your backstory. Okay, I'm Justine Fredak, and I'm a dual citizen of Canada and the US. I'm a longtime marketing executive. Uh, I worked in financial services for a very long time, and I'm currently the chair um, of a number of committees in Chicago, where I'm based. So I'm very active in the community and a big advocate for MS. And so uh, I, like Ben, found myself uh, diagnosed um, a little earlier than Ben at 31. And I was actually at the World Economic Forum when it was in New York instead of Davos after 9-11. And I uh, started to lose feeling in my toes and my leg. And within 48 hours, I was completely paralyzed and rushed and triaged to the hospital and told you of one of four things, uh, brain uh, mass in your brain, some sort of tumor in your spine, lupus or MS, um, but it was definitely you know, being caused in the brain. And so the number of tests I went through were very quick. So I was very fortunate because I was diagnosed quickly, uh, but I you know, really concerned myself with, will I continue in my career? But I did. And I'm here today in a new job as a chief wellness officer uh, for a private social wellness club in Chicago. So I'm very enthusiastic to hear more from Ben and uh, share this panel together with him. Well, uh, Justine, what went through your head the moment you received this diagnosis? What did you think was your future was going to be or, or was it even impossible to think about that? Well, Jane, being totally honest, I really didn't know, and I don't know if Ben knew what his diagnosis was, that is, as he can eloquently say now for us to anchor in Lorenzo's oil, I had never really heard of multiple sclerosis. I was much more familiar with muscular dystrophy. And so mm -hmm. I was a bit confused, to be honest, as to what I was being told. Mm -hmm. um, the diagnosis was quite frightening because I was told, you know, you probably will never walk again. Um, you know, you're from the, from the sort of, you know, upper body down, I had no sensation and I was being prepared for, uh, you know, a very different life than I had imagined. I was, you know, rising in the ranks in, in my corporation and I just been married, like gotten married at the time. I had already experienced a loss of a fiance early in my life to a tragic accident. And so the diagnosis for me was almost unbelievable. And to be honest, Jane, I started to laugh out of nervousness, mm -hmm. um, which actually then they tested me further to see, was that a reaction from my brain, which it may well have been, but I think mm -hmm. it may have just been the level of fear and disbelief because I had no idea what to expect. Yeah. And I had to go on quite a journey of learning what did this disease mean for me and what would it mean long-term? So it was very difficult in the diagnosis period because I had no information as, as a patient and as a, as a person. So I felt very helpless. Okay. And Ben, um, same question for you. I mean, you've already told us you had to go on a whole odyssey. Um, and finally, this odyssey comes to a conclusion and you find you have ALD. What did that mean for you in the moment? Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, reaffirm what a lot of rare disease patients uh, experience, which is when you finally get a diagnosis, uh, you feel uh, some relief, mm -hmm. uh, but also terror. Uh, relief because you finally know what you have. And mm -hmm. so uh, you have a name for the enemy and uh, you can get information uh, and learn, uh, but also terror because uh, personally, I went on Wikipedia, uh, looked up uh, adrenal catastrophe, and it was super bleak, you know, very grim. Uh, at that time, the, the entry on Wikipedia made it sound like it was very much like ALS. Uh, the disease is known as uh, Semmeling Krautsfeld's disease, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, you know, uh, terrible name and uh and i thought that's it you know i'm uh i'm going to decline very quickly and uh it is a, a progressive relentlessly progressive terminal disease and uh i didn't know that uh, there were um 
you know, many, many different phenotypes and that there were uh, also things that one could do uh, to slow the, the progression of the disease. And so my uh, neuro who diagnosed me was, uh, was very blunt, had a little bit of an unusual style. And he told me that uh, he was good at diagnosing zebras, but that he didn't know this disease. He didn't know of anyone on the West Coast who knew of this disease. Oh. And so he uh, encouraged me to uh, paddle my canoe, as he said, so to, uh, to do my own research and, uh, and uh, reach out to the lead authors on uh, any kind of research papers, which I did being, uh, being uh, uh, French. By origin, I reached out to one person who seemed to be the, the lead author, who was based in Paris, and, uh, and this person replied to me immediately, uh, you know, which is kind of typical of the rare disease community, and encouraged me to come to a, a patient meetup in Paris literally the, the next month. And so that was a very important event for me, which is I went to a, a meetup with about 300 patients you know, found myself surrounded uh, by a sea of wheelchairs and people on uh, feeding tubes and respirators. And I was absolutely terrified, but I had to kind of, you know, mobilize myself to, to go in and talk to people and make friends and realize that this was my new, my new tribe. And so for me, that was kind of the first step in uh, really, um, you know, entering this community and, uh, and, and becoming a known figure within it. And was there a point, Ben, in which you started to have hope? And what was it that, that gave you that, if you got it? You know, it took, I, to be honest, it took several years. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the, the hope came from, um, you know, a sense of community. And, uh, and hearing different patient stories and uh, learning that uh, some people were uh, thriving in life uh, despite having our, our condition, um, that um, some people were, were doing you know, better than others. Uh, then of course, knowing that they were uh, very committed, you know, very, uh, very smart researchers working on the disease and finally, gradually drumming up the interest of the uh, the biotech industry. So you know, we we got mm -hmm. uh, we got biopharma biotech companies uh, interested in working on our disease, uh, doing drug discovery, starting uh, therapeutic programs. You know, ultimately, slowly getting into uh, human trials, and uh, and we had to show that you know we had the community, we had the patient registry, we had a good understanding of natural history, we had a good sense of biomarkers, uh, and that we were united as a community. You know that we could accelerate uh, clinical studies, and so that of course gave me tremendous hope uh, when you know from a landscape of of uh, of zero uh, going to you know five or six. Uh, biotech companies uh, actively uh, developing treatments for us. Fantastic. Uh, what about you, Justine? Where did you? Was there a point in your journey where the hope switch switched on, and and what was that? I think for me, Jane, there were two things. So I was kept in the hospital back twenty years ago when you were diagnosed with MS. You you were in the hospital for several weeks. Hmm. So I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And my brother was actually a resident in cardiac surgery. And so I happened to be in the same um, grouping of hospitals that he was part of. And so he would, when he would round, he would round through neurology at the end of his rounds and come and see me. And there was a day that I was very down and I was in a lot of pain and I was not accustomed to neurological pain at that point. And so he said to me, listen, take control of the situation, learn everything about this disease. And he said, I went to medical school and I learned all these things. I knew nothing when I started. Mm -hmm. So I was in class, I read books. He said, just read everything. Just, you only have one disease to study. And he sort of put me on notice that it would be my responsibility to be my own advocate. And so that appealed to me that he was right. I could empower myself with knowledge 
And so I just immersed myself in everything, conversations, literature. And then at the time um, that I had this first exacerbation, I was very fortunate because one of the senior people from the company I worked for was with me. And he came to see me in the hospital every day. And one of the days I said, you know, I probably should go on disability because I don't think I'm going to be able to keep up. And I, I just, I, I was so down on myself. I didn't see any type of working future at that point. And he said, Justine, nothing about you has changed. You just feel differently about yourself. You are the exact same person. Your ability to deliver your work product is exactly the same. You're just thinking of yourself differently. I don't think of you any differently. So I had two people give me the opportunity to get back into my own body, even though my body was changing and was different to empower me to be who I was. And so much like Ben, I just immersed myself. I started, you know, getting involved in things, both socially from a community perspective, advocacy, but it was very difficult in the early stage to be open and be transparent because you're still calibrating in your own mind. What is this? How do I integrate this life altering diagnosis? How do I now walk with a cane and, and learn to do that? And how do I, you know, make sure that I can get up effectively and, and protect myself. And if I couldn't stand for long periods of time, where would I go and how would I look after myself? So in some cases it was somewhat humbling because you learn both to advocate for yourself, but also to ask for help periodically, which was not something I was very good at at the time. So I think that that's what started to empower me is recognizing my own vulnerability and then trying to strengthen it. Mm -hmm. And you said you got into advocacy. Can you tell us a little about that? So there was an MS walk. And at that point I was walking again, not not with any type of speed. So, you know, I think that famous story where, you know, I think the turtle wins. So I was definitely the turtle and I was quite slow, but I had a number of friends that said, Hey, we'll do the MS walk with you. And they said, you're good at raising money. Why don't you raise money? So I thought, okay. And they said, even if you can't walk, who cares? Raise money. That'll be the way you differentiate yourself and show that you still are like here with us. So I raised so much money that I won the top fundraiser for the MS Society. And I was given this, you know, medal that I, you know, that showed I'd raised, I think, $50,000 or something for this one walk. And that reminded me that, hey, even if I can't move around, I still have so many other things I can contribute. Right. So that started me being an advocate because I was like, hey, you know, maybe this sounds terrible, but like, I was like, you stop feeling sorry for yourself. So you can't wear the, these shoes you used to like, so you can't do that. Look at all the other things you can do. And that shifted my mindset. And that's when I said, you know what, I'm going to advocate. And I started speaking more just with people. And then I started getting invited to share my perspective of being in love with your life every single minute. And I had to say to myself every day, this is my life. And I'm going to live my most vital life. So maybe it's not like the next person, but it's going to be my most vital life. And I'm going to be in love with it. Beautiful. What about you? How, what about your advocacy, Ben? Yeah, so at, uh, I would say probably three things. So at a, at a basic level, it was to start our foundation, uh, ALD Connect you know, and to, to build the infrastructure and, uh, and then find, uh, you know, a few uh, areas of focus. Um, and one for us was uh, to lobby for the inclusion of the disease in uh, newborn screening. You know, we can actually diagnose our disease with a, uh, without a gene test, with a, uh, a blood test. So taking the, uh, you know, the dried uh, blood uh, from the little hill prick in the newborn, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so we've lobbied, uh, you know, state after state uh, to include our, our disease in the standard uh, newborn screening panel. Mm -hmm. And that actually has been amazing. Uh, now we have more than 60% of US newborns uh, screened for adrenodogodystrophy. And we're learning, you know, about um, prevalence. 
We're going to be able to monitor those kids and, and that's life saving. And uh, we're, of course, uh, you know, helping um, um, families get, get diagnosed. Uh, sometimes, you know, a little newborn screens positive and then you realize that, you know, 10 relatives are actually uh, yeah, affected or carriers. Uh, second thing is, uh, has been um, uh, to really, um, you know, almost minister uh, to uh, men who are affected, uh, particularly men who, who just got diagnosed. So this is a very cruel disease. Um, it, um, you know, I think uh, really uh, takes away a, a lot of what, what we would characterize as typical male attributes, you know, um, strength, uh, vitality, uh, and um, a, a lot of young men who are diagnosed are become very despondent. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've really tried to uh, mentor these men uh, to not only use my personal story, but uh, also um, uh, stories from history, like uh, President uh, Frank Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, you know, how he became president despite uh, being paralyzed and ended up, of course, being probably one of our two or three greatest presidents. And so not to let the disease defeat you, but to, to cope with the disease and then um, kind of reinvent yourself to have a, a great uh, life. Twitter or whatever it is, but and I would say uh, probably the, the third area for me was, was been advocacy around exercise. So I, I've seen the men, you know, fall into a, a, a sort of a, a downward spiral, you know, a, a, a bad cascade of you know, uh, feeling um, spasticity, stiffness, pain, take drugs to, to cope with those things, and then really become very, very, um, you know, very inactive. Uh, and uh, I, I've been a huge advocate uh, in terms of uh, exercising, uh, you know, with variety, with creativity, uh, to um, be able to stay mobile, active, and uh, fluid. Thank you. I think that no, I both, want to yeah, add to that, Jane, because I think what Ben's saying is one of the number one things that when some type of brain disease causes you to have less mobility, mm -hmm. it's very easy to stop and give up because it's much more difficult to move. And when I was in my hardest times, I forced myself to move more because I didn't want to give up on myself. And currently I'm not walking with a mobility device and I had for 15 years. I don't really know why the doctors at UCSF don't really know why, but part of me does think that those of us that remain positive and like Ben's story, we remain active. So whether that's, you know, many times I did Pilates and I couldn't move, but the, I had the instructor move my legs for me because I figured maybe my brain would remember the movement and I would, I would watch people on an elliptical and I would say to myself, I, I need like, to remember the like famously did. So uh, I, do, I do think that it is important to move in whatever way you can. If that's lifting your hand up and that's what you can do, then celebrating that. Because that may be a big achievement and certainly there were, and I'm sure Ben, you share that, that there are small triumphs, but they're hugely impactful. And we ourselves need to remember how important those tiny triumphs are. Thank you. Could um, somebody has uh, some background noise coming in. Could you please make sure you're on mute if you're not speaking? You know, uh, well, and both of you are also really even going deeper than that, what I've heard both of you say is, I remember that I am a human being, you know, just because I have this disability doesn't mean I'm not a human being with skills and creativity and all those things that come with being a human being. And I'll just share from my own experience, um, my mother has a terrible form of dementia uh, but she was a painter all her life. She can still paint a beautiful painting that you and I would be jealous. 
you know, if you saw uh, what what she painted. So, you know, even though there's, it's, this is not a physical disability, she's got a mental part of her brain has been taken away, but she, there's just no question that she's a human being, you know, and that there's this humanity that pours out uh, when she does a painting. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I would throw that in. Um, I wonder, just going back to the diagnosis, what do you think our listeners should know about what one might expect when receiving a diagnosis? And is there anything you wish you would have known that would have been helpful in your experience? I'll throw that to you, Ben. So I, uh, you know, knowledge and, uh, and connections. Um, so I think uh, at a basic level, uh, as Justin also pointed out, um, you know, get educated uh, on the on the condition. Uh, try to learn all its nuances, um, and then you know, understand the community. Who are the players? Who are the the you know the influencers? Uh, the great clinicians, the great researchers, uh, who in industry is looking at this and have an international perspective. Because what I, what I know is that in many uh, diseases, you know, there are great specialists in, uh, in Finland, Hungary, uh, Spain, South Korea, Israel, Argentina. You know, we, don't, we, we shouldn't think only of North America. Uh, and so, uh, you know, be open to have uh, international uh, discussions and then engage with these people, try to find you know, like-minded patients who share your, your perspectives, your priorities, and, uh, and try to find common ground uh, in terms of, you know, after telling your story and, uh, and, 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 and kind of sharing your perspective, but, uh, you know, take the next step and say, what are we gonna do together uh, to really um, advance our, our shared cause? You want to add anything about what you wish you would have known, Justine, or what yeah, what you'd like? I mean, I think that I think that sometimes we place unrealistic expectations on the medical professionals that are part of the journey because they know as much as they can possibly know, mm -hmm. and I think that we also have to remember that what's being told to us in a diagnosis is based on that particular moment in time and all of the information that they have. And that as time goes on and more information can be collected and medications can be tried and lifestyle can be changed, perhaps diet or sleep habits or you know consumption of various things or less consumption of various things, all of these things contribute to whichever ones of those cohorts you're going to be in for how your disease progression manifests. So I used to play a bit of a, a joke on all the doctors and tease them because they'd say, well, 96% of people never regain this. And I would say, oh, so 4% do? Mm -hmm. And they would say, yeah, I guess so. And I'd say, well, then I'll be in the 4%. And so then they would laugh and I would laugh and I said, well, somebody has to make up the 4%. And so Dr. Stephen Hauser at UCSF used to say, I like that attitude. You're right. Somebody does have to be. So if you want to be, you join that 4%. So just remembering that your own positivity can make that journey so much better. So I think in the diagnosis, I think both Ben and I have said, you tend to lose yourself in the terror of it, but we're examples of people that have thrived. And that doesn't mean that there aren't difficult times, but it means that you remember who you are and more about yourself than the diagnosis. So I think in the, in the moment, I wish that I had recognized that a little bit more saliently than, you know, at the, with the amount of fear that I had in those moments of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more, um, and then I'll open it up to the group here. Um, you know, at the American Brain Foundation, we're focused on advancing research that will prevent, treat, and cure brain diseases. And I'm wondering, you know, what funding research and supporting research means to you. you Want to go, Justine? 
Yeah, I mean, I think just picking up on what I just said, the more money that we can raise for various diseases and a lot of these things for brain can work together. So studies can be done that benefit many, many diseases. And I think that by remembering that research is allowing us to find these drugs. When I was diagnosed, there were what they called the ABC drugs for MS, which were beta interferons. The efficacy was very low. So there wasn't really that much hope. Now, if you're diagnosed with MS, it's a very hopeful thing. There's a there's very likely a, a possible cure on the horizon, given how research has helped the medical profession, the researchers, many academic professionals to find different solutions that make the disease much more manageable. So I do think that it's important to remember that progress is there. And so that Ben and I are people that are looking for those directions that will make living with the disease, we diseases we have much more um, easy, livable, but also ensuring that we don't forget that it's possible to find cures. And so research enables them to have better understanding in the medical field to help us as patients. And so I'm a huge advocate, which is why that on that walk, I realized, well, if I can raise $50,000 for this walk, then I better be constantly focused on reminding people that it's research that changed my disease progression situation from 20 years ago to sit down in a wheelchair and, you know, we really can't help you to the many people I meet that are just diagnosed that have no symptoms to manage. So I think that's very important that time, research, dedication, and money are what we need. Yeah, and you know, if if you don't mind my saying so, you you know, we saw you, uh, as I said at the beginning in Seattle last month at a big American Brain Foundation event, and you showed the whole audience uh, that you were walking in stiletto high heels, uh, whereas at one point it was sit down in that wheelchair and that's all you can do. So, I mean, that, and that's a direct result of research, isn't it? hundred percent, a hundred percent. The, the ability to take medications that were never even thought of 20 years ago are now helping people like me be as well as I possibly can be. And that's my own vitality. So again, it's important for people not to compare. I loved walking with my mobility device because I became good at it and it enabled me. But if there are things you can do to enable you that much further and research will help that, then why wouldn't we do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then what is the research uh, theme mean to you? Yeah, so I think, um... You know, when I look at adrenoleukodystrophy, I'm well aware that it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. You know, um, at the end of the movie Lorenzo Soil in 1992, you know, it, the movie, of course, uh, in, in Hollywood style, makes it sound like uh, a cure is just around the corner. And that's because, you know, the gene had been discovered. Uh, but here we are 30 years later, and we still don't have a treatment. Uh, we're getting closer, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a, there's still many things we don't fully understand about the disease. So what I'm excited about is, uh, you know, and I think the American Brain Foundation is very much part of that, is uh, identifying uh, new talent, new ideas. So young investigators who can think uh, out, out of the box, who come with new ideas, uh, I think we're on the cusp of some uh, some amazing breakthroughs uh, for you know neurological disease. I was just in a in a startup uh, investment review this morning, and I heard companies working in uh, next generation sequencing, uh, protein design, uh, revolutionary technologies around medical imaging. So I think we're literally, you know, a few years away from uh, absolutely amazing breakthroughs. And uh, what really resonates with me is also, uh, in addition to young talent, new ideas, is looking at the, the commonalities between uh, all these different neurological conditions, you know, uh, MS, ALS, dementia, Parkinson's, adrenoleukodystrophy. Uh, lysosomal storage disorders, and uh, understanding really um, kind of the patterns 
uh, of, of neural degeneration, which by the way, are a sort of accelerated aging. So there, there is also a lot of synergy with all the research that's going into the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the biology of human aging mm -hmm. and uh, the research around longevity. And so I think we're, we're very close to, to amazing breakthroughs. Thank you. Well, let me turn to some audience questions here and feel free to just uh, raise your hand or to put uh, a question into the chat. But there's one person here um, who, you know, her, his or her, Ruth, yeah, okay. Question just really resonates because we hear of so many people that it, you know, go on five and 10 year odysseys to figure out what they have. So she's saying she has a, a rare orthostatic tremor. Most neurologists have never heard of it. And my question is how can patients get an accurate diagnosis if doctors haven't heard of it? On average, it takes about seven years to finally get diagnosed. Advocacy must cast a wide net, but because disease is not known, it has been challenging. So, I mean, I know you went on a multi, it sounded like a multi-year odyssey, uh, Ben. So what, what are your thoughts on that? No, I mean, I have, you know, huge empathy for, for Ruth, for this person. It's very, very cruel and frustrating because the reality is an, an odyssey is never linear. So in my case, you know, I started really having pronounced symptoms around um, early 2010 got diagnosed in December 2011. And so I was not, you know, looking for a diagnosis for, for two years straight. I went in, uh, underwent a battery of tests, which were uh, painful, time consuming and costly. And then I was told, we don't know what you have. We have no clue. Get sicker and come back. Not a very encouraging message. And so I went home and I sulked. You know, I was yeah. I was angry and I sulked for six months until my wife said, you know, Ben, you're getting worse. You have to go back and undergo more tests. And so, you know, I, I basically went back and uh, dragging my feet literally and figuratively. And so um, so I, I think, you know, it's good in this case to to read stories of people who, um, you know, persevered in the, the diagnostic journey. Uh, there are also now a number of um, um, platforms like the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which has chapters mm. uh, in, in different medical centers like Stanford and UCSF and, uh, and um, you know, Mass General. And so um, you have to get to a diagnosis uh, because you, you need to know the enemy. You need to know what you could do that, that would be helpful and what you shouldn't do that is harmful. And you need to connect with fellow patients to have, you know, to hear their tips and insights and uh, lessons learned. And you have to find a clinician who knows your disease and is gonna, you know, keep uh, eyes on you and then potentially enroll you in, uh, in, in studies that could, uh, you know, really uh, get you better. I have someone named Pat here who says, I've not yet been diagnosed, although I've seen a neurologist, I've had two MRIs, I'm 78 years old, my balance has deteriorated recently to the point where I need a cane or walker. Two years ago, I was very active and took long uphill walks several times a week. But what diseases can cause balance problems with no other apparent neurological symptoms? Well, I'm afraid, Pat, to tell you that none, that I am not a neurologist, <laughs> even though I am uh, facilitating this event. I know, you know, that the American Brain Foundation is funding um, a, a clinical research training scholarship in something called mal de, de Bachmann syndrome, like a seasick balance problem, which is a neurologic disease that is uh, related to the inner ear. But I'm sure, you know, as in so many of these diseases, there are um, kind of repeating uh, symptoms. And so it's hard to know 
you know, it, it might be one of five or 10 or more diseases. Um, I don't know if Justine or Ben wants to say anything to that about balance problems. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, probably a good place to start is um, a, a kind of integrated movement disorder clinic, uh, because that's where they, they look at, you know, Parkinson's being the, uh, the, the top suspect, but a number of other conditions like, um, uh, you know, CMT, uh, uh, you know, and um, uh, spastic paraplegias and, and others. I will tell you kind of a a funny and not so funny story is that my first stop was uh, at the Stanford uh, Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, I actually was seen by, by the head of that clinic, who is a very well-known uh, physician scientist. Uh, she could not diagnose me. And I, I ran into her in a social setting about four years later. And I, I, I did what, you know, what doctors hate. I went up to her and I said, hey, I'm one of your patients. <laughs> and uh, she was very open. She said, remind me of your, 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 uh, your history. And I, and I told her what my diagnosis actually was. And she was very honest. She said, I would never have diagnosed you because, you know, I look at a, at a you know, middle-aged male like you and I would never think of adrenal catastrophe. To me, it's a pediatric disease with mm -hmm. kids who are, you know, having experiencing all kinds of behavioral and psychological symptoms. So looking at you, I would never have guessed. So I thought that was fascinating because it really shows, you know, as, as Justine said, the, the limitations, you know, and the, 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 the you know, self-confessed vulnerabilities of, of the clinicians who are not omniscient and uh, have blind spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a question here from Mary Hawk. I'm going to throw this to you, Justine. It really broadens things out. She asks, how did your diagnosis affect your spiritual understanding of yourself and the world? Were you assisted in this understanding by a chaplain or religious leader? So I love that question mm -hmm. because I'm a big time um, spiritual person to be totally honest, you're asking about religious leaders. So um, I'm a person of, of Ukrainian descent and my grandfather was actually the metropolitan of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. If anyone's familiar with the Orthodox Church, um, I think deer hunter, if you're old enough, would you would remember when the people got married, that was an Orthodox Church. If you're younger, it's, you know, the people with long beards and robes and usually big you know, miter type hats. And my grandfather was the leader of that church for Canada. He did tell me during the diagnosis period, don't ever give up on any kind of faith. Do not be angry. Always believe that you will be fine. However you are, you are still basically a beautiful creature meant to live a beautiful life. So when he passed away in 2005, he had quite an elaborate funeral and many of the priests, I was very, very close to him. He was my best, best friend. And many of the priests and bishops came up to me. It was quite an elaborate, large funeral and said, your grandfather prayed for you every Sunday and he wanted you to know that you will be fine. And just that um, in, internal love and faith and remembering that I was fine no matter how I was. And, you know, for, I think it was Ruth, it's very difficult to lose your balance with MS. It's a chronic thing. I used to fall constantly, still once in a while. I am still a little bit funny teeter-tottery at times, but I started to realize maybe I can't do that, but I can do this. So I do think faith plays a big part in motivating you. Whatever that you're wrestling with, whatever faith means to you, whether it's deeply religious through your church, your minister, your synagogue, whomever that you, you um, look to, I think finding something that connects you for some people, they'll say to me, well, my church is golf. And I say, well, if that's where you find yourself and find that higher connection. So yes, for me, uh, many spiritual channels have helped me uh, to find myself inside of this disease. Definitely. How about you, Ben? 
how has this affected your spiritual understanding of yourself in the world? Yeah, so, you know, I was, uh, I'm a believer and, uh, and was a believer before my diagnosis. And, um, and uh, you know, I, if anything, it's uh, kind of strengthen, strengthened my faith. Uh, I think in, um, you know, there is, when you get diagnosed, there, there is anger at God at uh, saying, you know, why me? Why, why, uh, why am I, you know, am I flawed? Why do I have this defect? And, uh, you know, why was I chosen to, uh, but then of course you, you realize that you, you were chosen maybe for, for a reason. <laughs> and I think faith helps as Justin said with, uh, with hope, uh, it reinforces the, you know, the, the concept that life has a tremendous value. Uh, it brings community around the, you know, a community of faith. And I think um, uh, generally faith is aligned with the, the concept of service and good works. And so it, it does reinforce even more the need to, uh, you know, to, to help uh, others. And, and in the end, you know, you, you will help yourself best by helping others. I, I love that you talked about anger because that was the number one thing that my grandfather said to me the two occasions my fiance died in a car crash three weeks after we got engaged do not be angry my diagnosis do not be angry and i do think ben you've hit on something so important because anger takes away our energy and we need that energy to fight these diseases mm -hmm. and so why waste it why waste it on anger and all of these other emotions keep that energy for healing and and for you know being as vital as you can wonderful um with this next one you know i wish i were a neurologist i will channel our board chair david dodic and i'll let you guys answer too it says brain diseases this is from ashok dementia alzheimer's ms multiple dystrophy are diseases which progress silently over a period of time and culminate in a crippling condition it seems that more efforts and money is spent combating these diseases when they have already advanced instead of spending these uh, resources to find ways and means to prevent them at the incipient or nascent stage. Mm. Um, now I know that ALD uh, mostly affects young men, young boys, uh, Ben. Mm. So what, have you, thought about this, about research, you know, where should it focus at people who have the full blown disease or people who, where it's nascent or it hasn't even shown itself yet? Yeah, I mean, a, every disease, you know, has its own, uh, uh, its own, its own profile um, for, uh, you know, dementia and, and uh, FTD, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, of course, it's a huge topic right now, because we know that you know, people can can have basically signatures of the of the uh, the the kind of the onset of the disease twenty years before they start mm -hmm. exhibiting serious symptoms, and so there is a lot of work going on around you know blood biopsies and uh, finding kind of traces of the mm -hmm. disease so that you could calibrate perhaps you know early interventions to to prevent the disease instead of trying fruitlessly to, to cure, you know, a full-blown disease. ALD is a little bit different because we, we uh, so we, we don't have a way to stop it. You know, we don't even really understand why it starts, you know, in, in, at what age and, uh, and, and in some people earlier than others. Uh, that said, you know, with the newborn screening, we now track uh, people who have the condition and, uh, and, and uh, you know, our disease um, has two, two pathologies. One is around the brain. Uh, and so there are options to intervene around uh, bone marrow transplant. And uh, we also have uh, chronic adrenal insufficiency, uh, which is kind of a side effect of our disease. And tragically in the past, many young boys would die of an adrenal crisis. You know, so they would get food poisoning or they would get a sunstroke or they would get the flu and mm -hmm. they would mysteriously die. And in fact, you know, they could have been saved by literally popping a couple of uh, pills of hydrocortisone 
And so now our parents know, you know, to recognize those, uh, those symptoms and be able to, uh, to, to, to basically save the lives of their, of their boys. Uh, so it is, um, you know, a small thing, but, uh, you know, uh, really life changing uh, that uh, we, we know what to do in case of emergency. Right. And, you know, um, one thing I can say is there's, if you want hope, you know, at that, at that early stage, there's the, also the case of spinal muscular atrophy. And the, the American Brain Foundation has uh, given substantial funding uh, for research on that. And um, that is literally a case where a brain disease has been cured with a genetic treatment. Spinal muscular atrophy, um, the you know sort of colloquial uh, name for it has been floppy baby syndrome. And the baby would, you know, usually die within 18 months to two years. And now we have um, photographs of uh, kids riding their bikes, running up and down stairs, who have been treated uh, with a genetic treatment um, that turns this disease around. And uh, like with ALD, as with ALD, it's now part of a screening process for newborns. We just had someone on our staff have a baby and the baby was screened for spinal muscular atrophy. And had they found it, they would have treated it right away with this genetic treatment. So there really is hope, um, you know, and there is, I think, more and more of a trend of going toward prevention. Um, as well as treatment of people that already have the full-blown disease. Any comments on your end of this, Justine? Well, and I don't know enough to be any sort of person to answer, but I, I wondered, and maybe you and Ben know more, but I, I think it's probably less talked about the research that's done in these areas. I know there's research being done in these areas for MS and other diseases, but we have so many great stories about how to manage disease when it's already, you know, quite aggressive or upon early diagnosis. So I do know that um, UCSF does have a number of, of different research programs going on. And same with that Northwestern that are about not necessarily preventing, but the whole remyelination and, and the prior to that, what's causing this, are there any ways to detect? So right. I, I think there probably are many things and we just don't hear enough about them. There are so many amazing things going on in the areas of neurology and brain. And I think that it's just so complex that we as you know general population people don't always know everything going on. But I think that's a wonderful question uh, because certainly I know many people that are very interested in finding out how to stop something before it starts. Okay. Well, we, we just have a couple of minutes left. I want to see if there's anybody else out there that wants to just, you know, barge in, turn off your mic, turn your mute off and ask a question. I think we have time for one more. Uh, and if not, we'll close out. Any further questions tonight? Well, I guess I have a question. I wanted to know how did I get so lucky to meet all of you and meet Ben? and have this opportunity to share this evening together. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah, and well, it's the power of researcher because the researcher who has helped you. That's right. Uh, you know, is someone we gave the award to this year. And we were just so happy to be able to put the two of you together and show the connection because research often seems like such an abstract thing but um, it literally affects people and it's literally going to be the reason we are able to cure brain diseases and also prevent them and come up with better treatments. Well, thank you, Jane and Emily and Ben for the work that you do that benefits people like me. Well, thank you both you and Ben tonight for sharing your stories and reminding us of um, the issue, uh, the, the big issues of humanity and spirituality and positivity um, and curiosity. Um, before we say goodbye, I just wanna thank everybody once again for joining us tonight. 
we host these virtual salon events every month and we'd love to see you again. Next month on June 22nd, we'll host uh, we, uh, a discussion about caregivers and how can we support care caregivers and what is the caregiver experience? There is um, a question in the chat about melatonin. Okay. Uh, melatonin is reviving our stem cell in our brain. Is it true? I have not heard that. That's not to put some, put down melatonin. I use it myself sometimes, but um, I have not heard that it, it um, revives stem cells. No, and Ben is saying no as well. Okay. Yeah, no, there is no effect of melatonin on uh, neural stem cells. Okay. So I hope that you'll join us on June 22nd next month when we host a session about uh, caring for caregivers with some really, uh, another one of our board members, Dan Gasby, and the director of Hilarity for Charity, that's uh, Seth and Lauren Rogan's charity, which has done so much in terms of respite for caregivers of people with brain disease, especially people with dementia. You can also follow us on social media and stay up to date on brain disease information and research. Uh, here's where you can go. And you can also support innovative research to find the cures of tomorrow by making a donation. And there, just really know that no donation is too small and all are deeply appreciated. We can't do this work without your support. So thanks again to our two lovely and wonderful speakers and to all of you who joined us for this uh, discussion tonight. Have a nice evening.